Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of John Casely, Edward Vardy and Nicholas Taylor who were all police officers and the murder of Michael Eustace which took place in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in 1863. But before we begin, can I just say, if you do enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here or haven't already done so, then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. And I would just like to add, as I always do now, that I do record these stories live, so I do sometimes make mistakes, which I always try to rectify, so I hope this does not spoil your enjoyment of the video. And this week's story will be slightly longer than those of the previous couple of weeks. Very little is known of the past lives of most of those involved with this story, so their information will be very, very basic. John Casely was born in Rothbury in around 1833. His parents are unknown. In 1863, he was said to be around 28 years old and was working as a police officer. Edward Vardy was born in Northumberland in around 1836 and his parents are also unknown. And he was around 25 years old in 1863 and worked as a police officer and was married to Martha. Nicholas Taylor seems to have no information at all other than the fact that he had been working as a police officer for around one and a half years in the Newcastle area. His age does not seem to be mentioned in any of the articles that I have seen. Michael Eustace, the victim, was born in Ireland in around 1838 to parents Thomas and Margaret and he was one of at least four children. He was around 24 years old in 1863 and the family had possibly moved to the UK in the early 1950s and Michael worked as a labourer. In the early hours of Sunday morning, June the 13th, PC Vardy was on duty in Pilgrim Street and on reaching the railway arches he heard a disturbance that seemed to be coming from the direction of Silver Street. Here he found a group of men and women who all appeared to have been drinking. He told them to be quiet and head on their way home, and all but two of the group left, and these two men were ready for an argument. PC Vardy attempted to take them into custody, but one of the men grabbed him by the throat and said he would not be taken. At this point, PC Taylor arrived on the scene, and the two officers managed to subdue the men between them. They headed down Silver Street towards the police station and on reaching the bottom of the street a brick was thrown at them by a small crowd of men who had gathered further up the street. PC Vardy noticed that one of the men involved was Michael Eustace who was known to him. He spoke to him and told him not to throw any more and Michael replied by saying let the men go then. The two police officers did not do this and continued towards the police station and the men on Silver Street continued to throw bricks at them. After taking their prisoners to the police station, the two officers, who had now been joined by PC Casely, were returning to the Silver Street area to resume their duties when they decided that they would go and apprehend Michael Eustace for throwing the bricks at them earlier. So they headed towards his home, and by now it was around 4 a.m. PC Vardy knocked on the door of the Eustace family home and someone inside called out who's there and PC Vardy replied the police. The door was not opened so PC Vardy gave it a push and it opened and on entering the room a scuffle broke out and Michael Eustace was injured when he was hit by one of the PC's truncheons. Although he was injured he was still taken to the police station on a charge of being drunk and disorderly and for throwing bricks at police officers. Once at the station, a doctor was called and he found that Michael had a bad wound to his head, which he cleaned and dressed. Later that day, he was sent back home to his family and on Monday, June the 15th, at around 1pm, Michael Eustace died of his wounds. And it would be after this that his family would accuse the three police officers of the murder of their son and the police officers were all charged with the murder of Michael Eustace. 
The inquest was held at the Manor's police court and the three officers were not present at first, having been kept in the cells until the witnesses had given their evidence. Thomas Eustace Senior said he was a shoemaker living in Silver Street and he had identified the body as being that of his son Michael who worked as a labourer. He said he had died at home in the presence of himself and Dr Rain and that he had previously been in good health. Thomas went on to say that on the night of June the 13th he was at home with his family in Silver Street. He had heard there had been some kind of fight in the street with the police earlier that night at around 1pm but he had not seen it. He said Michael had been home at the time and had opened the window and shouted down to the police in the street to leave the men alone and not murder them or he would go to court about them on Monday. He said after this Michael went outside but he returned to the house only a few minutes later and then went to bed. Sometime around 4am, Thomas said, he heard someone knocking on their door. He asked who it was and a voice replied telling him to open the door. He said he would not and that they should come back at a more reasonable time. Again, he said someone shouted for him to open the door and again he said no. This time the door burst open and three policemen rushed into the room. He said they all had their truncheons in their hands and one hit him on the arm and knocked him backwards. He then felt blows to his legs but he said he was not sure if these had been caused by kicks or by truncheons. His wife was by now shouting out, don't murder my man. Thomas said she tried to protect him and one of the policemen hit her hand hurting her fingers. Hearing the commotion, Thomas said his daughter and his sister-in-law leapt out of bed and came towards him. Thomas said one of the policemen pushed his sister-in-law out of the door and she was not even dressed at the time. He said one also pushed his daughter, who was only 14 years old, against a wall. He said that the screams from himself and the women in the house had awakened Michael and he shouted to his mother to ask what was going on. And Thomas said that as soon as Michael stepped from his bed, all three policemen rushed towards him. He did not know who had struck the first blow, but Michael was hit about the head and the body with the truncheons, and he saw that his head was bleeding badly. Michael, he said, called out to his mother to send for a doctor, and one of the policemen said they would get him a doctor at the station, and Thomas said they then dragged him from the house, still bleeding and barely able to walk. Mrs Eustace said Michael was her son and she had also heard of the fight in the street with the police earlier that night. She had watched from the window when Michael went outside into Silver Street. She never once lost sight of him and he returned to their home around five minutes later. She did not see him throw any bricks. She said when he came in he undressed and went to bed. Shortly after this she said she heard a knock at the door. On asking who it was and someone replied open the door. She said she would not, asking them to go away, but the door burst open and the three policemen came inside. She said Thomas asked why they had broken the door down, but they did not reply, hitting him and knocking him down. She said she too was knocked to the ground and they had hit her hand. They also tried to hit her other son, Thomas Jr., but did not manage to do so. She went on to say that Michael got out of bed only half-dressed and one of the policemen ran towards him and hit him on the head. He was still bleeding badly from this wound when they dragged him away to the police station. At this point all three of the policemen were called into the room and Mr and Mrs Eustace identified two of them as being the men in their house on June the 13th. The sister-in-law Sarah Walkman identified all three as having been in the room that night. Sarah Walkman was then called to give evidence and she stated that she'd been seen in Silver Street on June the 13th at the home of her sister. She spoke of being hit by one of the police officers and that she had been pushed out of the door when she was barely dressed. She had rushed back in and saw the police officers trying to hit her nephew Thomas but they had not managed to do so. After this she said Michael got out of bed and asked his mother what was wrong. She said almost immediately after this all three policemen attacked him with their truncheons. They hit him, she said, on the head and also on his body. She said he was not fully dressed as he only had his nightshirt and nightcap on. She concluded by saying that Michael was bleeding badly when he was dragged from the house. 
Dr. Gibb of Newcastle said he had performed the post-mortem on the body of Michael Eustace and he had found no marks anywhere on his body other than the head where he found two wounds on the left-hand side. He had found a small blood clot on the brain caused by one of these wounds and it was his opinion that this had been the cause of death. He said that all of the other organs of the body were in good condition apart from the heart and liver but he said these had not contributed to his death. Dr. Rain said he had also examined Michael and was in full agreement with Dr. Gibb as to his cause of death. It must be noticed that Dr. Gibb is not the police surgeon, he was an independent doctor. Dr. Bush said he had examined Michael at the police station on the night of June the 13th. He had at first found him responsive and able to walk when asked, but later he appeared to faint. However, it did not seem to him to be in any danger, so he did not suggest that he was sent to the infirmary. Inspector Donaldson said he had been on duty at the police station when Michael had been brought in. He said he was not dragged in and he had walked in unaided, although he did have a wound to his head which was bleeding. He said he had later been charged with throwing bricks and being drunk and disorderly. PC Vardy said he had been on duty in the early hours of June the 13th when he had heard a disturbance near Silver Street. On arriving, he found a group of men and women who all appeared to have been drinking. He said that Michael Eustace was one of the group. He ordered them all to leave, but two did not go. He said that he attempted to take one into custody, but another grabbed him by the neck and said he would not allow it. At this point, PC Taylor came to his assistance. One of the men ran away, but PC Taylor gave chase, and they then tried to take the two men to the police station. At the bottom of Silver Street, a brick was thrown by someone, and it, he said, came close to his head. On turning to look back, he saw Michael lift another and throw it. He said they told him not to throw any more. They were able to reach the station with their prisoners, and on returning to their duty, they were joined by the third officer, PC Casely. At this time, they discussed returning to Silver Street to apprehend Michael Eustace. PC Vardy said he knew the man and knew where he lived. And on arriving at his home, P.C. Vardy said he had knocked and someone had asked who was there. He replied, saying that it was the police and to open the door. On pushing the door, it gave way and as soon as they were inside, he saw three men lined up in front of them. Thomas Eustace Sr. had a core rake in his hand, Michael was holding a poker and Thomas Eustace Jr. was holding an object of some kind, but he could not be sure what it was. Almost immediately, Michael hit out with the poker and B PC Vardy said it hit his arm and at this point he showed a wound to his arm which was viewed as being quite severe. He continued by saying all of the men in the room then attempted to attack the police officers who in turn all drew out their truncheons. There was a scuffle and he was aware that PC Taylor did strike Michael on the head with his truncheon as he saw the boy fall. After this, when it was slightly calmer, they were able to take Michael into custody. He said that he was told, Michael was told, that he would be seen by a doctor at the station. When asked, he said Michael had not been in bed when they arrived, he had his shirt and trousers on, and nor had he been unable to walk when he was taken into custody. He had simply put on his coat and left with them walking between Casely and Taylor. P.C. Casely said on the night of the 13th he had been near the bottom of Silver Street when he had seen Michael Eustace throw bricks at Taylor and Vardy. He said after this Michael ran away back up the street. He then assisted the officers in taking their prisoners to the police station. Later he said all three headed to Silver Street to apprehend Michael Eustace. His evidence at this point was almost entirely the same as that of P.C. Vardy only adding that he believed Thomas Jr. appeared to be holding a piece of iron in his hands. He said Taylor had been the only one to hit out at Michael and he had reached him over the shoulder of Vardy. He said he had done so because Michael was making a second attempt to hit Vardy with the poker. And he also agreed that Michael had not been in bed asleep when they arrived. He was dressed in a shirt and trousers. P.C. Taylor said on the night of the 13th of June he had heard a great disturbance in Silver Street. On arriving, he found Vardy struggling with two men, so had gone to his assistance. 
He said he saw Michael throwing bricks and stones at them as they escorted the two prisoners down Silver Street. And he said on their return to Silver Street, the scene in the house was exactly as described by the other two officers. And he also believed that Thomas Jr. was holding a bar of iron in his hands. He saw Michael attempt to hit Vardy for a second time with the poker, so he struck out at him with his truncheon, hitting him on the head, and he believed he did fall down. He said as they were about to leave for the station, Michael asked for a doctor and was told he would get one at the station, which he did as soon as he arrived, and he also agreed that Michael was fully dressed when they arrived at the house. None of the police officers spoke of either Sarah Walkman or the young daughter of Mr and Mrs Eustace. Mr Fiddes said he was a sergeant at Newcastle and he had been called to the house of the Eustace family by Michael's mother after the disturbance. The family were suggesting that their son had been murdered. He noted that there was blood around the room and he said that Sarah Walkman showed him a bolt which she claimed had been forced from the door when the officers entered the room on the night in question although he himself could not see where the bolt had been on the door. He said she also told him that Thomas Senior did have a coal rake in his hands and Michael a poker, and she said it was a shame they had struck out at the police. On examining the house, though, he said he did not see a coal rake, a poker or any bars of iron. The coroner then spoke addressing the jury. He stated that the doctor who had examined Michael Eustace was clear that there were no wounds on his body. The only wounds were to his head, which he believed was the cause of death. The police officers had all testified to the fact that only one of them had raised their truncheon against Michael, and that was P.C. Taylor. The other witnesses, he said, had given wildly different versions of the events of that night, and it was for the jury to decide who they believed to be telling the correct story. However, he did not feel that any of the evidence pointed to a case of murder. And if they believed the officers' testimonies, testimonies, then they would be in the position to find only the policeman, Taylor, guilty of manslaughter. The jury retired for 15 minutes, and on their return, they found no case to answer for Pacey's Vardy and Casely, and they found Pacey Taylor guilty of manslaughter, and he was committed for trial. I did not find any details of an actual funeral for Michael Eustace. However, one newspaper did report that the family held a wake for their son on the night of June 14th at their home in Silver Street, as would be the custom for the family. I did not find any evidence of a headstone for Michael anywhere in the area. The trial took place at the end of July in 1863 at Newcastle, though no actual location was given. Nicholas Taylor pleaded not guilty to the charge of manslaughter. Much of the evidence at the trial is the same as that at the inquest, so I will only include the newer or the different details. Thomas Eustace gave much the same evidence as he had done at the inquest, only adding that when the police came in, they had used so much force that he saw the bolt come flying off his door. He said he had asked why they had broken in, but no one had replied, but they had immediately struck a blow at him, and he was knocked down senseless. He said Michael was not up and dressed when they came in. He did not have his trousers on, as he had been in bed asleep. And when asked, he said he did have a coal rake in his hand when the police officers entered the room, but he had not attempted to hit anyone with it. He had simply been raking the fire with it. Mrs Eustace gave similar evidence to that at the inquest. However, when questioned, she denied saying that Michael had only just come in when the police arrived. She also said she did not say he had a poker in his hand, nor did she say that her husband had a coal rake in his hand. She said when the police began to drag Michael out of the house, it was his sister who said, here are his trousers, and he then got dressed before being taken to the police station. Thomas Eustace Jr. said he had been at home with his parents in Silver Street when the police arrived. He was awake when they arrived, and he saw P.C. Casely strike his father with his truncheon, and his father fell to the ground. His father did not have a coal rake in his hand at the time. He said he then saw the same policeman hit his mother on the head with the truncheon, and he then cried out, Are you trying to murder them? He said Casely and Vardy then both tried to hit him, but missed. 
He said Michael then woke up and shouted what's going on and he said that first Casely, then Vardy and then Taylor all hit Michael with their truncheons. He said PC Casely also struck a blow on Michael's back. He said Michael was to be taken to the police station but he said because he did not have his trousers on he had offered him his own but his aunt had said here are his trousers let him put them on. Dr. Rain again stated that Michael had no wounds about his body and that the main injury was a blow to the head. There was simply no evidence to back up the suggestions that he had been beaten about the body. PC Vardy gave very similar evidence to that at the inquest, adding that he believed Thomas Senior had fallen over a stool in the room and this was how his arm had come to be injured. He said PC Casely did not hit Michael about the body before they removed him from the home. And PC Casely also gave similar evidence to that at the inquest, only adding that when Thomas Senior fell, he fell towards his wife and she fell also. He did not see anyone strike any blows towards Thomas Senior or Thomas Junior or Mrs Eustace. Sergeant Fiddis said he had gone to the Eustace family home with PC Taylor at around 5am on the morning of June 13th. Thomas Senior was not present at the time. He said Mrs Eustace was in a very excitable state and she made the following statement. When the police came into the room, Thomas Senior had the coal rick in his hand. Michael was standing next to him and Thomas Junior next to him. Thomas Senior had been out drinking all night with Michael and they had not long been in. Michael picked up the poker to, to defend himself when the police arrived. Sergeant Fiddis said she continued by saying, when Thomas Senior fell, she fell also and she hurt her finger. He said she then spoke of her poor son and the blood around the house and she said she was not sure which one of the police officers had hit him. Sergeant Fiddis went on to say that when Thomas Senior had come to the police station to collect his son, he had made the following statement. He was sorry that Michael had picked up the poker and he was sorry that he had used the coal rake but there was no saying what men would do when they had been drinking. PC Taylor at the trial did not give any evidence on his own behalf. The judge in summing up said it was for the jury to decide if they believed the evidence given by the police officers who stated that the Eustace family had attacked them first or if they believed the evidence of the Eustace family who said the police had simply broken down their door and attacked them all for no reason. There were, the judge said, many differences in the testimonies given by the family, some of which were trivial but others were more important to the case. On the other hand, the police officers all gave the same or very similar evidence. And there was also the evidence given by Sergeant Fiddis, who spoke of Mrs Eustace giving a very similar statement to that given the police officers given by the police officers, which she had changed since then. He concluded by saying that they must decide if the blow struck by Pacey Taylor was a use of excessive violence or if it was done to protect a fellow officer. If they felt the former, then it would be a case for manslaughter. The jury retired at 6.15pm and it would seem that they had many difficulties in reaching a verdict and the judge was called back into court at 8.20pm as the foreman wished to speak to him, telling the judge that they could not reach a unanimous decision. It was then that the judge told the jury they must retire again until they were all agreed. The jury finally returned at 11.15pm when they stated that they found the defendant, Nicholas Taylor, guilty of manslaughter. It would not be until the following day that the judge would sentence PC Taylor and addressing him he stated that he agreed with the verdict of the jury that he had used excessive force when he had struck Michael Eustace and for this he would sentence him to three months imprisonment. I did not find any details of which prison PC Taylor was sent to, nor did I find any details for him after the trial, and I also found no further details for PC Casely. However, for PC Vardy, I did find that in 1865 his wife Martha died along with their young daughter, and Edward would later go on to marry 
again and have four children with his second wife. By 1871 he was working as a railway inspector but by 1881 he had returned to the job of police officer and was working in No Shales. Pacey Edward died in 1897 at the age of around 60 years. This was an incredibly strange story. As you will no doubt have noticed, none of the Eustace family seemed to tell the same story and often contradicted themselves and each other. So it would have been very hard for the jury at the trial or the inquest to find their evidence correct. The police officers, on the other hand, all seemed to tell the same story. And in the end, it seemed to come down to simply whether or not the jury believed that Nicholas Taylor had used excessive violence or not when he struck out at Michael Eustace. And I have to admit that I found it hard to know who to believe at times, though it has to be said that the police officers' testimonies did seem more credible. I believe the judge in passing sentence based his three months imprisonment on the fact that P.C. Taylor was defending his colleague in the event of an attack by Michael Eustace. But was three months enough for the death of Michael? Well, I'm not really sure that it was. But again, I believe that this was based on the idea that it was done in defence and that it was accidental. But what do you think? Do you think there was any truth at all in the evidence told by the Eustace family? Or do you think the evidence from the police officers was the correct version of the events in the Eustace family home that fateful night? Do you think three months in prison was enough? Or should P.C. Taylor have been given a harsher sentence? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this sad and tragic story interesting and I am sorry that it is quite a long one but there was rather a lot of evidence this time and I do hope that you have stuck with it to the end. And I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.